Let's pray before we start this morning. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for an opportunity this morning to gather, to, to open your word, uh, to sing praises to you. And Father, as we do open your word this morning, as we've been um, thinking through vision, as we've been um, uh, led by you in the direction that you would have us to go, and we're thinking about that, and we're talking about that, and we're sharing that with one another. Father, I pray that this morning as we look at one aspect of that and what you're calling us to do as a church and what you're calling us to do as, as individuals, that you would impress upon our hearts today how this applies to, to us individually. Um, we know what's written in your word. We can read that, yet we need your Holy Spirit, to guide us and to lead us into that truth. And so we pray that would be accomplished this morning in what we say and do, and that we would, um, that, that would be accomplished in our lives after in how we apply this. And we'll be careful to give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. As I said, we've been um, looking at our vision statement, and we've been breaking that down. We started last week by by looking at drawing near to Jesus, and we're going to continue this over the next um, two weeks after today. But today, the phrase that I want to focus on in our vision statement, which is drawing near to Jesus, we passionately pursue those far from him uh, to become his church. I want to look at that phrase, um, the passionately pursuing those who are far from him and what that means this morning. And as we do that, I'd invite you to turn to Luke chapter 15. Luke um, chapter 15 is... I would say is my favorite chapter in all the Bible. Um, it contains three of the most famous parable, parables in Scripture. The story of the shepherd who's lost his one sheep, and so he leaves the other 99 to go and find it. The woman who has uh, 10 coins, and she loses one, and so she basically looks through a whole house and move, moves furniture around and sweeps the floor again, and there's this idea that she searches a long time to find it because it's precious to her. It's valuable. And then we have the story of the lost son, and we've come to know that as the prodigal son, that story. Jesus is, is teaching, and he's spending time with, with people. He's spending time with all kinds of people, and there's crowds that are gathering around him. And as the crowds gather around him, they want to see him, they want to hear him. And he's risen really to, uh, he, he's a rabbi, he's a teacher in, in Jerusalem, in the area, in Judea and Samaria, the area of Israel. And he's risen really up the, the ladder as far as rabbis go because he's teaching things and he's teaching in a way that no one has heard and no one has, uh, he, he's a profound teacher. He's teaching, the Bible says, as one who has authority. And so he has crowds that will gather around him. But there's a dilemma here in Luke chapter 15 because you have two very distinct, two very different groups of people here that are undeniably really woven into the very heart of this story, these stories. You, you can't separate the fact that Jesus is surrounded by people and he's teaching these groups of people. You can't separate the fact that they are unique to the situation. They are... Uh, critical to the situation and us understanding the story. On one side, you have the upset religious folks who, who seem to be angered with what Jesus is doing and the people that Jesus is hanging around with. On the other side, you have the people that Jesus is hanging around with and you have this idea that Jesus is in the center of the crowd and these people are gathering around him and they are called the tax collectors and the sinners. They're identified as the, the worst in, in the society that Jesus is teaching in, that he's involved with, that he's engaged in, the worst kind of people to hang around with in this day. Look at verse 1 and 2. It's up on the screen for you this morning. It says, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him, and the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners, and he eats with them. See, Jesus was probably in the outer court of the temple, maybe in the marketplace, and gathered around him 
right in the thick of it are these tax collectors and those who are called sinners. They're the worst kind of people that the Jews knew in their mind. The religious folk that are at the fringe, they're, they're judging them. They've already made up their minds about these people. They're the worst. And Jesus is welcoming them and talking to them. Tax collectors were basically Jews who had sold out to the Romans. They would go and they would purchase a, a, a quota like a, a note from the Roman authorities and it would be expensive. But they would then be able to tax their fellow countrymen whatever they wanted. And the Romans would say often, well, you can add some charges onto that. You can add some fees onto that. They're already charging an exorbitant amount of money and yet they say to these Jews who have bought these things from the Romans to say you can tax a little bit more, you can charge your fellow countrymen a little bit more. And so they had this reputation amongst their own people as being, as being crooks. You know, you're ripping off your brothers and sisters, your fellow countrymen. The sinners in this context are people who did whatever they wanted. They were not followers of the law that the Pharisees held to be so important. And, and so at the outset of this chapter, Christ is in the middle of this group of people. The worst kind of people in that day. And just outside of that crowd are the religious folks. They're just close enough to hear, but, but not close enough to be associated with this rabble. And and they're grumbling and they're complaining and they're saying, I mean, this man eats with sinners and, and he receives them and he talks to them and he hangs around with them. How dare he do that? And that's what's going on here as people are gathering around, the religious at the fringe murmuring and grumbling. And as I read the scriptures and as we read the scriptures, I think it becomes introspective for us we look at ourselves as we see through the lens of scripture and i have to ask the question do we ever see ourselves do we ever find ourselves doing that at the edge of the crowd grumbling about people like that talking about what they do what they say and we're pleased with ourselves because oh i'm not like that i don't do that we don't talk to them we don't look like them because we don't do what they do. I admit this morning, I've, I've been there. Willing to complain and judge instead of passionately pursuing those far from Jesus. You see, Jesus says, I have come to seek and to save that which was lost. When he was taken up into heaven, he says to his followers, he says, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. So I send you to do the work, to continue the work that has begun in me, is really what he's saying. The Pharisees' dislike of the sinners and and the tax collectors is, is a profound theological problem here. They understood very well that God is holy and God is perfect, and yet they knew nothing of his compassion and nothing of his mercy and nothing of his grace. And that's ultimately, I believe, why Jesus tells these stories in the context of these people in the, in, in, with an earshot of those who are gathered around him, including the religious folks on the fringe. Every one of these stories demonstrates that a God who had lost something significant would be driven to find, to go after, to seek, to passionately pursue that which was lost. It is a risk for Christ here. Uh, to be found in this group, to go to the center of this crowd, to not push them away. I mean, if he hangs out with those kinds of people, some people might think that, that he's not serious about sin. And so he tells the story uh, of the lost sheep. He tells the story of the lost coin. And then ultimately in verse 11, he tells the story 
of the lost son. Look at that with me this morning. And he says, There was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that's coming to me. And he divided his property between them. And not many days later, the youngest son gathered all that he had. And he took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. See, Jesus makes a point here of saying this story to show that he is not light on sin. He's serious about it. And sin is an offense. And, and he demonstrates here that the son has offended the father in several ways. The first thing that the, the son does is that he asks for his inheritance. In the Jewish culture, even today, you don't do that. It's basically saying to your parents, you know what? I wish you were dead. I wish you were dead. It, it, it's, it's deeply offensive. The worst offense a child can impose upon a parent. And, and the Pharisees knew that. And, and no doubt they're appalled by that. They're appalled at this son who would go to his father and say, you know what, I want my inheritance. And basically by saying that, I wish that you were dead. A second offense is that he asks for it immediately. He says, I want my inheritance, and I want it now. It's the, the context of how he's asking is, is just like that. When the text says he gathers all that he has, what the father has to do here is he, he cashes out a portion of the estate. I mean, unlike today, the estate isn't measured in cash. It's not measured in stocks and, and bonds and insurance policies and, and investments. I mean, instead, the wealth is measured in land. It's measured in, in animals and livestock. And, and so he has to sell these things. He, he takes a portion of the land that he has and he, he sells it. He, he takes a portion of his animals and as he's divvied them up, he has to sell that off so that he can get the money that he can give to his son. In the Jewish culture, you don't sell land that's part of your family estate. It's valuable. It's passed down. The hope would be that, that the sons would live there and they would live on the land and they would develop it and it would be really the retirement plan for the father. They would look after him. So it's, it's offensive that this young son would come to him and say, I want my inheritance and I want it now. Third offense is that he takes it and, and he squanders it. It says here that, that, that he squanders his inheritance in reckless living, the land, the flocks, the, the family's really social security here. Aged parents would make it through the end of their lives by living off the estate, by being looked after by their family. The sons would live on the land. They'd take care of the, the parents. They'd take care of the family. It, it, was, it was a social tradition. So, so the money as it's given to the son, there's this unwritten rule that he would take that money and later on he would, he would be saving some of that and, and then he would help to support his parents in their old age. But not only does this rebellious son take part of the estate, takes part of everything that his father has, but he takes it and he goes off to a faraway land and he squanders it on reckless living. And when we become independent from God, it's sin. Definition of sin, one definition of sin anyway, is, is doing things our way instead of God's way. It's deeply offensive to God. Christ makes it clear here that he understands sin. He understands the the weight of it. He understands that it's offensive to God. The sun goes on a journey, but it's not just a journey, is it? It's not just a trip to uh, uh, another land to, to take his inheritance. He's really walking away from the Father. What he's saying is, you are dead to me. I've taken what you have given me, and I'm blowing it. I'm taking it. I'm spending it on myself. Notice in 
verse 13, his steps away from the father, his steps towards independence, he squandered his property with reckless living. When you're reckless, you do anything you want. There's no leash. There's no boundaries. You know, step number one in the downward spiral of sin is, is independence. You're walking away. You're taking those steps away from God. Leads to a, a high price. Verse 14 says that he spent everything. Sin is, is an expensive business. It's never, it's never an investment. You know, when we sin, we always spend relationships. We always spend health. We always spend time. We always spend resources that we will never get back again. We might think, you know, it only affects me. I mean, yeah, I'm selfish. Yeah, I'm doing some things that I'm not supposed to be. But you know what? It's only affecting me. It's only about me. It's only ever about me. That's wrong. Verse 14 says, when he'd spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country and he began to be in need. So he went and he hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. Some of you here are pig farmers. Some of you, like me, like to eat pork. <laughs> Bacon. But we don't live in a Jewish society. Pigs were taboo. They were not kosher. They were forbidden by the dietary laws in the Old Testament. He's in a faraway land, which is a stretch. He, he's, he's working with the very thing that his countrymen despised, frowned upon. But more than that, he's doing a job that the farmers didn't even want to do. It was hired out. It was really more of a favor to him because they realized this guy is way away from home. and He's got nothing, and it's famine giving him a little bit of money. You think of the moment there. Think, think of the, the downward spiral of this journey that he's on. The, the text says he's longing to be fed in this famine. With the pods, they feed to the pigs, but no one gave him anything. And some of us have been there. Maybe not literally, physically. Figuratively, we've been there. We felt the downward spiral of sin. We've been caught in that vortex for, for something to satisfy us. The only problem is that the longer it goes, the emptier we feel. Verse 17 says ultimately he came to his senses. And, and we also do that. We've also been there. Maybe sometimes we go to bed at night and we put our heads on our pillows and we say to ourselves, how in the world did I get here? How did I get to this place where I feel like I'm so far from God? I can't believe that this is where I am. And he's desperate. This is desperation, the feeling that you have to do something about your situation, the whole downward spiral of sin. And that's what led this boy to wake up. Verse 17 says that when he came to his senses, how many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread? And I'm dying out here with hunger. I will get up and I will go to my father. And he practices this little speech that he's going to give to his dad. I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. Remember that. Remember that for later when we talk about it. Make me as one of your hired men. And maybe you're reading the story, and maybe as the Pharisees are hearing the story, the religious folks that are on the outside of the story, they're saying, finally, this kid gets it. Finally, repentance has come. But he says he's no longer worthy to be called his son. He'd be glad to be made as one of his hired men. In the system of that day, there's really 
three kinds of servants. There's one who's called a bond slave, and they were owned, they were property. They attached themselves and really threw themselves at the mercy of, of the owner because they had nothing. They, had to, they were in a position where maybe they'd lost their property, maybe they'd lost their family, and they're just throwing themselves at the mercy of someone to be a, a, a bond slave. And there's a relationship there because they're totally dependent upon their master. Then there's household servants who had a little bit more independence. Finally, there's hired men who may, like, might live in the towns and the villages. And, and they would be brought in and they would be hired in on a daily basis. And they would be paid their wage at the end of the day. And they would go back to their village and there's independence there. They were, they were working. They're hired to do a job. Have you ever met someone who says, you know, I don't like where I ended up. I, I need God. But when they reach out for God, you know, really what they're saying is, well, it's got to be on my terms. It's got to be on my terms. And I think that's a bit of what this boy is doing. This isn't repentance yet. It's desperation. Jesus is not light on sin. And so he tells this story to make a point. I can be compassionately committed to these worst kinds of people in your eyes, but I fully understand that sin is offensive to the Father in this downward spiral of an individual's life. At this point, you can almost hear the Pharisees and the religious folk on the fringes saying, you, you got it, Jesus. Maybe Jesus is not such a bad guy after all. Because this guy gets it. I mean, look at all these people that are surrounding him. I get what he's doing now. They're sinners. They've, they've offended God. They're in this downward spiral, and, and Jesus is preaching at them. It's like a fire and brimstone. It's like a turner burn. We love that kind of stuff. But we read on and we realize Jesus isn't done yet. He moves from the sin to God. He moves from the sinner to how much the sinner's worth in the eyes of God. Look at verse 20. And he arose and he came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, the father saw him and felt compassion. And he ran and he embraced him and he kissed him. And I find myself wondering how this father saw him from such a long way off. I wouldn't be surprised if this dad on a regular basis walking across his estate didn't cast his eyes down that Road maybe didn't cast his eyes down the path that his son took as he was leaving home just to see if his son was going to return. You see, I think he was looking for him. I mean, it fits with the other stories, doesn't it? The, the shepherd leaving the 99 to go and look for the one that is lost, the uh, the, the lady who's basically moving her furniture and tearing her house apart so that she could find a coin. But we're not talking about inanimate objects that we've misplaced. We're not talking about uh, uh, an animal who's, who's running away on instinct. We're talking about an independent, thinking, living soul who can choose to go or stay. In some sense, if I were the dad and I saw this boy coming home, I might say in my hurt and pain, wow, he's finally coming home. But, but then thinking to yourself, this guy embarrassed me. He, he broke every Jewish custom. He's, he's offended me so deeply. But the text says when he saw his son a long way off, he felt compassion for him. You realize the one who is offended most deeply was the one who cared most deeply for this boy. And I think that tells us why Christ is here with these people, this crowd, this, 
rabble, these sinners, these tax collectors, because he knows they're sinners. He, he knows they have this label. He knows what the people on the outside are thinking about people on the inside and what they're thinking about him. He knows those things. He's seen it. He's heard it already. It's not a surprise to him. They're hated. They're the worst kind of people in Judaism. But he sees through that because he knows their worth and he feels compassion for them. And he reaches out to them so that he can bring them home. Because that's what Jesus does. I have come to seek and to save that which was lost. Do you see people like that? Where you get to a point where you see their worth more than their sins and their faults, it, it struck me this week because sometimes I am way more like a Pharisee and someone on the outside looking in than I care to admit. Even with people in the church. It, it's easier to judge a person by their faults, by their heart. So much easier to look at What's wrong with them than together what is it that we're doing right? So much easier to focus on how far there is to go than, than on how far they have come. You know, why do we do that? I hate that. And, and if we do that with one another here, how are we ever going to reach the kind of crowd that Jesus is talking with here? How are we ever going to do it? The text says not only did the dad feel compassion for him, but the dad ran to meet him. And when this Jewish dad ran and grabbed the boy, throwing his arms around him and kissing him over and over again, it would have shocked the Pharisees to hear that story because a kiss in Jewish culture is basically to say that you have been given full acceptance and full friendship. You have been restored. And they wouldn't have liked that. In that public way, he receives him, he restores him, and, and the boy falls before him. And the boy says, Father, I've sinned against heaven, and in your sight I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Interesting that that's where it stops, period, there. Doesn't go on to the rehearsed speech. And maybe it's because the father doesn't let him. I think that's what it is. He doesn't ask to be made one of his hired servants. The boy is stunned by grace. The arrogance of his spirit is melted because he had offended this one so deeply and yet his father cared so much for him. And he throws himself at his father's mercy and this is repentance. True repentance is when we come to God with, with no deals, no strings attached. We can't cut a deal at the cross. There's no negotiation. There's no strings attached. We stand before the cross of Christ and we realize in that moment what a terrible offense our lives have been to God. And yet he reaches out and he compassionately welcomes us. And there we fall in repentance and we throw ourselves at his mercy with no deals. Nothing in my hands I bring. Simply to the cross I cling. When the dad received the son, it's a marvelous act of grace. You know, if, if I'd been the dad, I'd, I'd say, you know, let's go home. Your mother's going to be happy to see you, as I am. Your brother, maybe not so much. <laughs> By the way, I'm glad you're back. And I welcome you back into my home. But the rules haven't changed. It's still my house, and, and you know what? You're going to be on a short leash for a while. But, but it's amazing what the father in this story does because he takes them back to the tent or whatever they had and he says, bring me a robe, which is a sign that, 
that he's family. He says, give me the family ring, which is a sign of family authority. And he says, get shoes for this boy's feet, which was a sign that he is a free man. He's not a slave. He's not a servant. He's not a hired man. He is my son. And he's going to live like that. See, God the Father has beautifully recognized the worth of the sinner. He's totally forgiven him. And he's not put him on a short leash. He's cut him in to the family. No conditions, no leashes. He's, he's fully restored him to the Father and to the family. Christ said, I'm with these people because God the Father has compassion on the lost son. And he passionately pursues those who are far from him so that he can bring him into his family. He told this story to explain to these Pharisees at the edge of the crowd why he was with these people that they had such an issue with him being with. You know, one of the important applications for us today is, is the searching of our own souls because when we look around us, maybe the worst kind of people in our culture who are so unlike us in thought and value and and philosophy and orientation, do we see them through the eyes of compassion? Do we see them as Jesus sees them? He sees them, yes, as sinners because he's not light on sin. He's serious about it, but he sees what they can be in him. Do we see them like that? I've been in the church my whole life, and I love the church. But I wonder sometimes, why does the church produce so many mudslingers? I mean, I think of uh, some of the churches that I've been involved with, and I have to admit, some of them have had a lot of people in them that were just cold. Sure, there was joy when they were together, but whenever there was something outside of the status quo, they clammed up. They didn't think about things that really mattered anymore and genuinely ignored certain people who looked different. Somebody's marriage went sour. They threw some mud at them. Somebody's kids were a little wild. More mud. Selection of music was a little different. More mud. Somebody didn't dress the right way. A little bit more mud. I, I think people liked playing in the mud, and, and they liked picking it up, and they liked throwing it. I've learned to hate that. But sometimes I find myself throwing mud at the mudslingers. And, and I realize sometimes that, that I've thrown mud myself. This guy I grew up with, his name was, was Mark. He, he was different. He looked different. He dressed different. Not a social outcast, but he wasn't in the in crowd. When our group got together and played hockey, you know, he wasn't invited. He was never invited to birthday parties. It wasn't that we didn't get along with him. I, I mean, I did. But on the others, left him out for, for some reason. Came from a tough home. His mom was a believer. His dad was rough. He's a little scary. He's a big guy. They weren't wealthy. I assumed they had a tough time, yet they did their best. In high school... Mark began to make some choices that were appalling to the good Christian kids. You see, Mark smoked, and he drank a bit. He probably did some drugs. But I think Mark was trying to fit in because he just didn't fit in in the church. I remember going on a canoe trip when I was in high school. It was a church trip, and, and he brought a, a pack of cigarettes with him, and he hid, him, he hid them, and... I wasn't going to tell on him. I was trying to befriend him. I thought it would be a good opportunity to do so. And yet, as we're canoeing in, we're quite a bit ahead of everybody, and he smoked them all on the way in for our trip. Tuesday night, he, he's out there over the fire trying to get some smoke. I don't think that helps. <laughs> but I remember seeing him out there doing that. One night we're in our tents, and I'm with another guy, and Mark's by himself, and Mark starts telling jokes. Do you want to hear something funny, he would say, and then he'd tell a joke, and one time he said, do you want to hear something funny? And, and I respond by saying to him, do you want to hear something funny, Mark? 
Nobody cares. I picked up some mud and I threw it. It wasn't the right thing to say. And I knew it right away, and the silence was deafening. I didn't sleep much that night. I, early in the morning, I talked to him right away. And I tried to make it right. See, I who knew better had said what perhaps many others had said to Mark, instead of encouraging him, instead of loving him and caring for him, which is what Jesus wanted me to do. And that was more than 20 years ago now. Probably more like 25 years ago. And I tell you, it may not seem like a big thing to you, but it has radically impacted my life. God has revealed to me afresh again this week as I have been praying for my heart for the lost. Those who are far from him. There are people who are different. They look different, they smell different, who have different set of beliefs than we do. And sometimes our fear, in our fear, uh, that if we befriend them, we will just start to look like them and act like them, so we don't do it. But yet, and sometimes in our fear that if we start to hang out with them and start to be with them, that we might look like them and we might act like them, we forget that maybe, just maybe, they'll begin to look like us. And more importantly than if they look like us, because we are fallen and we make mistakes and we mess up, but more important than that, maybe, just maybe, they will begin to look like Jesus. Jesus tells this story to show that there are always people around who are left out. Maybe it's someone at work who you might not pay attention to or nobody pays attention to, or it's a, a widow that doesn't get visited very much. And maybe there's a wall between you and, and a person who doesn't do what you do or look like you do, and, and you never meant for it to be there, but you haven't really gone out of your way to break down that wall either. You, you could begin to cultivate a friendship with someone who's different than you, and you will be amazed how... God can use a life that's lived for him in front of a world who so desperately needs to know and to hear what a real Christian is. So where are we today? Are you long on anger and short on mercy like the religious folks who are surrounding the crowd? Do you have more commitment to your frustrations than you do to your compassion? If that's the case, then something needs to change. We need to move from, from playing in the mud and picking it up and throwing it at people. We need to move from that to people who passionately pursue those who are far from him. To let his compassion flow through us. Let's pray. Father, as we gather this morning and we're confronted by the story of Jesus who had compassion on the tax collectors and sinners and he ate with them and he spent time with them and he taught them, much to the amazement and disagreement of those around him who didn't think he should. I thank you that he gives us the example because he was given the mission to seek and save that which was lost. And he gives us the example as he extends that baton to us, as he extends that mandate to us to say that you need to do this. You need to passionately pursue those who are far from me because I love them. And I want them to understand what you have, to understand what you've been given. Father, I pray this morning as we think of our own lives, as we reflect on our own lives and the things that we do, the things that we say, the 
people that we hang around with, the people that we don't. That we would be able to have the courage of Christ who is not light on sin. He's serious about it. I trust that we're serious about it in our own lives. But was willing to see the worst of sinners as worthy of the gift of God. And may we do the same as we extend compassion, as we passionately pursue those who are far from him to become his church. That they might join the family of God and that we might be the disciples of Christ that desires us to be as we make more disciples. Father, help us with this today. Help us as we look into our own hearts today, tomorrow and the next day. As we look at this passage again in our own time to see how Jesus met with these people and loved them, had compassion on them. And may we do the same. In Jesus' name.